ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم إني أسألك علما نافيا رزقا طيبا وأملا متكبلا آمين سم آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سورة المؤمنون This surah was revealed in Mecca it has six stanzas, 118 verses, 23rd by the order of arrangement and 74th by the order of revolution. The name of the surah, the opening verse, Qad aflah al mu'minun, and this is followed by the explanation of the traits of al mu'minun. So the surah gets the name from these starting verses the time period of revolution it was revealed in the second of the middle period of mecca and hazrat umar radiallahu ta'ala and who he reports that um, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting with us that the state of revolution started and after completion prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he raised his hands and he supplicated Beautiful are the words of the supplication of Prophet Sallallahu He said, Oh Allah, don't let us be few, increase our number. Don't let us be weak, make us strong. Don't deprive us, bless us. Be pleased with us and please us. Similarly, in other tradition by Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there is, uh, he said, that Prophet Sallallahu was sitting among us, that the revolution started and we could feel it like a buzzing and a humming sound in front of his face. And when there was the completion of the revolution, Prophet Sallallahu smiled and he addressed all of us and he told us that 10 verses have been revealed. And if someone will come up to the merit of these 10 verses, that is, the person will develop the traits mentioned in these verses, then I shall guarantee paradise for him. Subhanallah. And then he recited these 10 verses of Surah al muminun So we will be going through these verses with the desire that and supplication that may be, may we be one of them. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. The basic topic and the summary of Surah Al-Mu'minun is the subject is to invite and to convince for faith on Allah, on Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and on the Day of Judgment. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Certainly will the believers have succeeded. So in the verse number one, Allah has said that who will be the successful, who will succeed on the day of judgment will be the believers. Belief will lead to success. And what is belief? Man amana billahi wal yawmil akhiri wal malaikati wal kitabi wal nabihin. Belief is what believing in Allah, believing on the day of judgment, in the angels, believing in the books, and believing on the prophets. And remember, belief is by the word of mouth, it is a state of mind, and not only both these, but also providing and proving by our actions and deeds in what we believe in our hearts or by our word of mouth. Believe will lead to success here and hereafter. And uh, explaining uh, the merits of success, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next nine verses will explain the traits and the manners of the believers followed by the reward in the next two verses. So what are the believers like? Verse number two, they are who during their prayers 
are humbly submissive. So the believers, the first trait of the believers is that in their salah, they are khoshin. Khoshin ain. It means to submit, to surrender, or to fear. Khoshin are who? They are all those who are humble and humbly submit to their Lord or all those who are God-fearing. So the first trait is of the believers is that while they are offering their salah, they submit humbly to the Lord. And while they are offering their salah, they fear their Lord. Remember that for the person offering salah, the state is not just on his body, but also has to be in his mind, in his soul, in his heart. The state is not just physical, but it also has to be psychological. For example, Prophet saw a person who was fiddling with his beard while he was offering salah. And he said that had he been submissive at heart, it would have reflected on his body also. So offering salah with total concentration, with total focus and humbleness is what we mean with khashra'in. So how do we acquire this desired state? I will be giving a few tips to develop khushu in our salah. Few improvements, a uh, few tips which will lead to improvement in the focusing and in the concentration during our salah. So the first thing is point-wise. I will just keep on telling you the points and jot down the points and remember them and adopt them to improve the focus and concentration of your salah. Number one, a proper, a meticulous, a perfect planning before salah considering it as a meeting with Almighty Allah. Number two, waiting and planning for Salah. We know that seven people who will be blessed with the shade of the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment. The first is the person whose heart clings to the mosque. That is, he waits for the Salah. Number three, adjusting the daily routines and your daily timetables according to the time of salah. The next, answering azan, answering the call for salah, the proclamation for salah. And then next, the sunnah, adopting the sunnah of reciting the supplications and the rood before salah and after azan. This is developing what? This is creating a hype before we actually stand before our Lord. The next is being very meticulous and being very sensitive about performing evolution and wudu according to the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is again a good and a proper preparation and reception of salah. And then adopting and uh, taking up a proper, complete and a neat dress for salah. Taking up a peaceful, clean, quiet, comfortable environment and a place for offering the salah. Then to let ourselves be free mentally from all worldly commitments like sleep and meal and voiding, all these we should be free from. This will be just if we, we have planned our routines and activities according to the timetable of Salah, our meal timings, our sleep timings, we should be free mentally and physically from all forms of commitments and all forms of fatigue and exhaustion also. Then the next step is uh, to offer salah as Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has suggested, that you worship Allah and you offer salah like as if you are seeing your creator, you are seeing your Lord. And if you cannot, if you cannot acquire the status and the condition that you are seeing your Allah and your Lord, then at least impose on yourself a feeling and sentiments and condition and state of affairs that he is watching you. He who is all seeing is seeing you when you are standing on the state of Salah. So develop a feeling of meeting and conversing with your Rabb in Salah. The companions, the companions had this frame of mind. 
before they started their salah, they had this state of mind that they're going to meet their, they're going to meet their Allah. And that is why we learn that some of the companions, they, their faces used to turn pale after wudu. And when they were asked, why was this? They said that we fear that we're going to, we're going to stand before our Allah and we're going to start our meeting with Allah and their faces used to turn pale after wudu. Another tip which was suggested by <clears throat> Hazrat Abu Ayyub Ansari, anhu, he said that when you stand up for salah, stand up with the thought that it might be your last salah. Subhanallah. Remember, with this feeling, inshallah, the concentration and the focus and the quality of salah will definitely improve. And then there was an imam. One of his students noticed that his quality of salah was beautiful. And he asked him, how did he improve the concentration in his salah? So he suggested and he told that before starting my salah, I imagine an environment around myself. I imagine an environment around myself. And I, I feel and I think that in front of me is the house of Allah. Behind me is the death angel. And beneath my feet is the hell fire. And around me are the gardens of Jannah. And he said, he added, then when after imagining all this scene around me, I offer salah, I feel a definite improvement in my submission during salah. Then another point is that recite the Quran in your salah slowly. Try to learn the meanings of the verses of verses of the surahs of Quran which you recite in salah and, recite, and try to learn the meanings of the words you're going to recite in salah so that you understand what you are saying. This will improve your focus, your concentration of salah. And then recite in a low voice, which is audible to your ears. This will also improve the concentration. Keep on changing the verses and keep on changing the surahs which you recite in Quran while standing, while bowing, and while prostrating. For example, in Raku, we can recite all the five supplications which, which have been taught to us by Prophet Wasallam. And in bowing down, in prostration, we can keep on altering and we can changing all the supplications similarly in prostration also. And uh, then I would want to mention the mannerism of submission and concentration and focus of the companions in their salah. We learn from traditions then when companions they used to they used to stand they used to stand and they used to bow down in raku their raku used to be so prolonged and their backs used to be so straight and so static that pigeons and birds used to come and sit on their birds, considering or assuming them as wooden planks. How conscious they were regarding their submission and focus and concentration during Salah. Hazrat Abu Talha bin Zayed Ansari, anhu, it is reported in Bukhari that once he was offering Salah, in his orchard and they were all palm trees around him and the dates were full and they were ripe and there were bunches of full ripe dates hanging from the palm trees that while he was offering his salah a beautiful bird it came chirping and his eyes caused they they caught sight of the bird and he traced it and the bird flew to a bunch of dates and there because of all these observations, his, there was a mistake in his salah. And after completing his salah and uh, offering his sajda sahev, he went to Prophet Wasallam and he offered his orchard of all these palm trees. He offered his orchard for charity, explaining to Prophet Wasallam that his all this orchard and these palm trees laden with the ripe dates and bunches of ripe dates has started distracting him and catching his concentration and so decreasing his submission and concentration and focus of salah so he will give it in the path of Allah. So this is how they acquired, how sensitive they were, how mindful they were. And that is why they reached the state of Hoshain. 
Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Verse number three, and they who turn away from ill speech. They turn away from all love. What is love? All conversation and all activities which are useless, pointless, and non-productive, which may be a source of waste of time and effort and energy. Because, you know, a true believer, when comes across such conversation, does not indulge in it. Or a true believer, when comes across any love activity, does not become a part and parcel of it. Why? Because a moment, a believer knows that he is in an examination hall. This world is what? This is a period of trial. So the moment who knows that he is being tried and tested, he does not indulge in any form of love. Because how does a student sitting in an examination hall behave? We all know that. The student realizes and very well knows that the student has to attempt his examination sheet. And he has to attempt and solve it according to the prescribed syllabus. And he has to attempt it within the given time period. The student also realizes that the time is running out. The person or the child in the examination hall also knows that he will fail and, we be, and he will be unsuccessful if the paper is not solved before the time period is out. That is exactly why. That is exactly why we never come across students in the examination hall discussing about love about a drama serial, about the plot of a movie, about, about the designing of their dress. No, they do not. So this is how a moment in this life does not indulge in any form of love. Then verse number four, the next trait is, and they are, they who are observant of zakah. They, this means that they are uh, the obligatory zakat, which is obligatory for all the believers on their, on their wealth. And this is the right of Allah. And moreover, they do what? They are observant of purification because tazkiya means what? To purify. So they are observant of purifying. They try to purify their body, their dresses, their environment, their souls, their eyes, their, their speech, their conduct, their mannerism, their environment, and their company. They are observant of purification. Verse number five, and they who guard their private parts, except from their wives or those whose their right hands possess, for indeed they will not be blamed. But whoever seeks beyond that, then those are the transgressors. From verse number five to seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the trait of all the believers or the mu'minun is that they have modesty and they cling to chastity. Resorting to any form of extra marital relationships or to indulge in any methods of physical satisfaction which are not lawful and they are prohibited by Quran and Hadith is not a conduct of a true believer. Verse number eight, and they who are to their trusts and their promises attentive wallazina li amanatihim wa ahdihim ra'un so here is another trait of all the true believers and the mu'minun that is they are trustworthy and they keep up to their promises prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported to say in Muslim and Bukhari, he has, he has related what the signs of a hypocrite. Ayatul munafiq ruba'a. I'm repeating the verse again. We, told about, we talked about it while we were talking about telling lies, and it is repeated again. Very, very important is this hadith to be learned and remembered. And to refrain from all the three, four, uh, four characteristics or traits of a hypocrite, which Prophet has mentioned, the four traits of a hypocrite are what is a hadatha, qadaba, is a ahada, or when he makes a promise, when he makes a pact, 
when he makes a pledge or an oath, he he does what? He commits a breach of pact. He breaks his promise. And the next is that when he is given a trust, he's entrusted with something, he is what? He is not trustworthy. So if a person after uttering la ilaha illallah and after announcing and declaring and believing that he is a Muslim and he is a believer, despite that he is not trustworthy, then he has signs of hypocrisy. As the Hadith says, despite the fact that he might be offering salah and he might be paying his zakah. So how important amanat or trust is? Allah says, وَلَّذِينَ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَأَحْدِهِمْ رَعُونَ Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that a person who does not keep his trust has no faith and the person who does not keep his pledge has no belief. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, al And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has explained how, how careful, how sensitive it is to important it is to keep trust. Prophet Sallallahu himself was what? Al-Sadiq, the truthful, and Al-Amin, the trustworthy. Trustworthy for whom? Not only for his family, for his, for his friends, but even for his, for his enemies. Just remember, just repeat, at the night of migration, when he was, his house was encircled by the enemy, with the plan of assassination. How stressful. How stressful. How, how fearful and how, how anxious Prophet ﷺ must have been for his life, for his honor, for the life of honor of his four daughters. But even then, in this stressful situation, he remembered, he remembered about the trust of the enemies, all those things he had been trusted by the enemies and which enemies who were planning his assassination, who were forcing him to leave Makkah, who were persecuting, who were oppressing all the companions. These enemies, their trusts he remembered and not only he remembered, he planned to return and he handed them over to whom? Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the nearest and the dearest, he took him as a son-in-law and he gave him, handed him over the hand of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He hands over all these trusted amanat to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be returned it to the enemies. Hence, we return, we, we return for ourselves. We need to be careful and mindful of all those things being entrusted to us. And remember, we have all sorts of variable things which have been entrusted to us. For example, trust, it, it envelops all our lives. A teacher, a teacher for him, the time of the students, the dues paid by the parents is all what? It is a trust. In return of all these, he has to teach him dutifully and conscientiously, a patient, the life, the health, the fee that the doctor is charging against the medical advice is what? It is a trust for the physician. Similarly, a surgeon, the patient's body, the exorbitant charges for the surgical procedure the doctor is going to charge is all what? It is a matter of trust. But imagine if the surgeon just sits in the surgeon office sipping his coffee, whereas his junior is performing the surgery. And he just shows up before the general anesthesia. This is what? This is being dishonest. This is being untrustworthy. Remember, remember all these things, this electricity, the gas supplies, which have been provided, the supply of water, the supply of gas, the supply of all these electricity amenities by the state at our doorsteps is all, is all trust of the state to the citizens. We need to be trustworthy in the usage, in the paying 
of the dues dutifully and honestly, misuse of all these will be defaulting in our trustworthiness. Not being trustworthy, being unreliable is devious. It is devious and it is a deed of shaitan. For the believers, for the believers, we need to be trustworthy and to be mindful and to be sensitive and to be careful and to be protective about all what we have been entrusted with. Verse number nine, and they who are careful about maintaining their prayers. So the last attribute or the last trait of the believers or the mominun is that they take care of their salah. So you see the starting trait and the ending trait, both is salah. This highlights the importance of salah in the life of a believer. Taking care of salah, what does that mean? Taking care of salah starts from before the time of salah. <coughs> it starts from before the time of salah and it extends much even after the time of salah. So it means what? It refers to taking care of protecting the salah means to offer it in the best time and to gain the maximum reward, to care for the purification before it, to take care of the prescribed dress, uh, prescribed dress code, to take, uh, take care of the selection of the clean and pure environment, and during salah, to take care and be mindful of the control of our gaze, of our body, of our minds, the ideas coming, the thoughts which are coming, to be mindful of the correct recitation of the verses of Quran, that is the pronunciation of the words of Quran, to be mindful of the sunnah of Prophet Wasallam for offering salah, to be mindful, to keep concentration and understand the words of salah which we are uttering to be meticulous about reciting the various verses and du'as during salah, to be careful in fulfilling all the promises and pledges we've made in salah. This is protecting salah, and this is one of the most difficult part of protecting and maintaining the salah is that all the pledges and all the promises we made, we, we keep up to them. Then to be mindful for all the trainings we've received from Salah, that is of humbleness, of punctuality, purity, fear of hereafter, of piety, and then to be vigilant of Salah of all those who are under our influence, are under our control, our subordinates, to be mindful of all of their Salah also. So this is carefully maintaining the Salah. When the people will have all these nine traits, then what will they end up with? Verse number 10, those are the inheritors who will inherit al-firdaus. They will abide therein eternally. And certainly did we create man from an extract of clay. So the next verse is starts until here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that the, the reward of all the mu'minun who have the traits which have been mentioned on in the nine verses, they will be the inheritors of what? The firdaus. Firdaus is a name mentioned for Jannah in Quran many times. And it is the Arabic word which refers to what? Firdaus refers to a huge garden, which is a personal property with fence ring around it, like no trespassing allowed. Hence, it is a private, it is a huge private garden, and it has all forms of lush, green, thick vegetations, fruits, flowers, scents, all forms of pet birds and springs and fountains and streams flowing through. And moreover, also has the residence of the owner emits the lawns also. Firdaus in Arabic, and this term has been used in other languages also. For example, English, it is called paradise. In Latin, it is called paradise. In Greek, it is called paradisus. 
in Sanskrit, it is called Pardesa. In Abrani, it is called Pardes. In Persian, it is called Paradisa. So let's pray. Rabbi ibni li'inda kabaitan fil jannah. Allahumma inni as'alukal jannatul firdaus. And moreover, let me remind you that we learn from traditions of Prophet Sallallahu that this is going to be the highest level of Jannah, which is immediately beneath the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is from here that the four rivers of Jannah, they originate. So I would want to talk here about one important thing, and which is what? Salah and establishing of salah because for as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the traits of the believers and the reward of jannah the starting and the ending is both with salah salah how excellent a deed it is remember it is the most frequently the most frequently ordered com commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran, 700 times in Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention and give the order for Quran, Akimu salata, akimu salata, hafizu wa salawat, repeatedly 700 times. And 70 times together is zakat and salah mentioned together in Quran. There were two salah mandatory and obligatory while the period in Medina, uh, in Mecca, and then after the 12th year of prophethood, there were five obligatory salah, and then they carried on. How important salah is. As salatu imadu deen, as Prophet Sallallahu says, it is what? It is the pillar of Islam. Salah is what? Mifatihul Jannah, it is the key to paradise. And what it is, Prophet said, Salah is what? It has been made as the coolness of my eyes. And Salah is what? Prophet for the two sunnahs of the Fajr prayer, he said that they are dear to me as compared to all what is in the earth and in the heavens. It is a pillar of Islam. As Hazrat Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari, Buni al Islam ala khamsin, shahadatan an la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad al Rasulullah, wa ikam is salati, wa ita is zakati, wal haji wa saumi Ramadan. Four pillars of Islam. And you know that without a pillar, without a support, a building cannot be erected or constructed. So similarly, the building of Islam, the building of Islam will not be erected without these pillars. And the second pillar of Islam is what? Salah. The pillar of Islam, Salah not there, the building of Islam will not be corrected. And once the building of Islam will not be corrected, there will be no place for that person in the palace in the buildings of Jannah. So what are the pillars of Islam? Number one, the four things, uh, the uh, Buniyal Islam is on five things, is to admit that there's no God but Allah, and then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his messenger, to offer prayer, to pay zakat, to perform pilgrimage, and to keep fasts in the month of Ramadan. How important Salah is? Has a Jabir radiallahu ta'ala who has reported in Muslim, that Prophet ﷺ said, al abdi wa bain al kufri salah. Between a bondsman and a disbeliever, there is only the giving up of prayer. Hazrat Buraida has reported that Prophet ﷺ said, The covenant between me and these people is that of prayer. Whoever gives it up, who go, whoever gives up his salah intentionally will obviously will be what will be turned out of the ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, Hazrat Ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari and Muslim that he was asked, Ayyul amalu ahabbu ilallah, which act among the religious duties is most, most pleasing to Allah. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, the first act which is most pleasing to Allah, as salatu li waqtiha. The, the salah, the salah which is offered at the right time. Summai, then what? Birrum bil walidain. 
serving one's pa parents summa i then what al jihad fi sabilillah to jihad, do jihad in the path of allah then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has promised as a tuqba bin amir radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in muslim that he said paradise shall be granted to the muslim bondsmen who perform wudu thoroughly and then stand up before allah and offer two rakats of prayer with single minded devotion similarly in musnad ahmad it has been reported that was prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the bondsmen who offer two rakats of prayer in such a way that there is no trace of negligence in it allah for, allah will forgive all his previous sins in return of the salah and then salah is a matter to decide who is a believer and who is a hypocrite it has been reported by hazrat abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in muslim and bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said for a hypocrite no prayer is more tiresome than a prayer of fajr and isha and he added that if he would realize how magnanimous the rewards of these two prayers is he would come to attend even walking on his knees so as allah says in quran wa iza qamu ila salati qamu qusala it is the character of it is the manner of hypocrites who come who think that salah is difficult for them and similarly prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has added how important the asr salah is has a ibn umar has has reported in bukhari and muslim that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if anyone abandons the asr salah it is as though he has been cut off from his family and his property remember when remember when the companions used to learn and find out that somebody has missed the asr salah they used to go and they used to console him as if they had found out that any of his near dear ones has passed away Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has clearly announced that the difference between a man and a disbeliever and a believer is what abandonment of salah a person who offers salah is a believer and a person who leaves salah according to the words of hadith is who is a disbeliever and how important it is to offer the salah just for the sake of allah it has been reported in ibn majah by abu said radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he asked should i not tell you something more dangerous than the dajjal's fitna than the fitna of the dajjal companion said do and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said concealed polytheism more is more dangerous than the dajjal and what is concealed polytheism he said that it is that a person stands for prayer and elongates the prayer due to the reason that somebody is watching his prayer as allah has also said in surah maun wailul lil musallin allazina hum yuraa'una wa yamna'una al ma'un wo while one of the distractions is for the person who is offering salah but is exhibiting and demonstrating that he prolongs his salah anybody who um, it is reported by the words of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that who prayed with intention to show off he committed polytheism allahumma la taj'alna minhum how important salah is salah is for a moment a salah is for a muslim a best source of training salah teaches us punctuality it teaches us how to purify our body our clothes our sight to keep it under control salah teaches us total self control control of our gaze of our speech of our body of our hands the whole body it tries us how to acquire a state of purity and a state of self control it trains us to adopt the islamic dress code it trains us to walk for the sake of allah and the path of allah it teaches us discipline it trains us for equality of color creed race no discrimination all standing together in the congregational salah then salah removes kibr arrogance from our hearts instills and infuses humbleness trains us for humbleness when we are bowing down when we are prostrating 
it teaches us brotherhood, fraternity, it, it promotes and it provides chances of inquiring about one another. All this is what we get from the congregational salah and even from our personal salah. And then remember, salah, all the stages of salah, all the stages of salah, starting from the listening of azan to the ending of the salah, they are all a source of reward, source of forgiveness and blessings from Allah. Like we learn from the words of Prophet wasallam, that when proclamation for salah, the azan for salah is announced, the shaitan runs away to roha. This has been reported by Jabir who in Muslim. So to save ourselves from salah, uh, from the acts of shaitan, it starts saving. And then we learn from the words of Prophet wasallam, that once the bondsmen, after listening to the azan, they answer the azan and the proclamation and they recite the rood and the dua which has been taught by Prophet wasallam. then Prophet wasallam has guaranteed that they will, he will intercede for them on the day of judgment. And then we learn that between the period of azan and proclamation of azan of the salah and akamat being called, dua is accepted. <coughs> Similarly, the wudu of salah. Wudu of salah has been reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who in Bukhari and Muslim that how it is, it is a source of expiation for all the sins. Prophet sallallahu asked that tell me if there was a river at the door of one of you in which he, forced, uh, he washed five times daily. Would any filth remain on the body? The companion said no. And then he explained that this is like the five times of prayer by which Allah obliterates the sins of his bondsmen. Prayer extinguishes the fire of hell and washes off all the sins. Prophet Sallallahu has also explained and narrated that how, how when a person performs wuzu, all the sins of the parts of the body being washed by the water, the sins are washed away also. He's explained that when he puts water in his mouth, the, all the sins which were committed by the mouth, the tongue, they will be washed away. When he washes his face, all the sins of the face, even under his eyelashes will be washed away. When he washes his hands and his arms, the sins even under the nails will be washed away. So this leads to purification, the wudu and the abolition. It leads to the purification of all the sins. And when the person performs wudu, Prophet Sallallahu has promised us that when the person performs wudu according to the sunnah, meticulously and sensitively according to the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu and then recites, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and then recites, Allahumma ja'alni min at tawwabina wa ja'alni min al mutatawkhirin, then all the eight gates of Jannah are opened for him. So this is salah. And this is the excellence and rewards of salah which start even beyond we start the actual actual act of worship itself. As a Salman anu has reported in Tabrani that Prophet said that he who performs ablution in the best way and then comes to the masjid for prayer is the visitor of Allah and it is incumbent on the host to regard his visitor. And how does he regard his visitor? Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari that Allah arranges hospitality for the person who attends the mosques in the morning and the evening. And how does Allah honor his guest is by forgiving his sins. And then when the person after performing wudu, who is what? He is the guest of Allah and who is the host to the person who is going to offer the salah in the mosque. The host is Allah. How is he rewarded? Hazrat Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala and who has reported. And there are multiple traditions which report what? That for each step, each step, one who comes to the mosque to perform prayers with congregation, a sin is pardoned and a good act is recorded in his record of deeds at every step and on coming to the mosque and going back to home. And then there is another tradition which explains that when the person performs ablution, comes to the mosque with intention of prayer, the writers 
the writer angels write down 10 deeds in his record. And those who sit in the mosque waiting for the next prayers, angels write down his name in the list of the pious and obedient people and his reputed as praying from the time of coming to the mosque and going back to his home. So for each step, in one tradition, we learn one and the other, we learn 10 rewards, 10 blessings, 10 raising of his standards and 10 requitance of his sins. So this is Salah. So this is Salah. He is, he is given, he is awarded a grade at every step. And this has been reported by Azat Abu Huraira, Razillahu ta'ala, in Muslim. So coming from a far off place, Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, one who comes in the mosque from a long distance to offer prayer will get more reward than the one who comes from a little distance. So the, the, the rewards go on increasing. And similarly, Hazrat Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to offer prayer with congregation is 27 times more, has 27 times more merit than than it is to offer alone. So this is Salah, how it is a source of, of washing off of all the sins, forgiveness of all the sins, the rewards, and the raising of the standards of the person who is offering Salah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we remember not only is all the stages of Salah a source of forgiveness and blessings, but we also learn that Salah is going to be helpful for all the stages of the bondsman in the life hereafter also, leading to all forgiveness of sins, like Hazrat Abu Dhar Ghaffari radiallahu ta'ala and who he is reported in Muslim Ahmad that one day Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out and the trees of um, the leaves of a tree, they were falling and he shook them and the leaves, they began to feel, uh, they, they began to fall down certainly. And then uh, he, he explained that when a person offers prayer solely for the sake of Allah, his sins fall away like these leaves. So the path of hereafter becomes easier for the person at each state because of the salah. It is Salah, which is going to make all the stages easy for the person. It, it makes the death of the person easy. And then the questions of the grave become easy for the person who, who used to be careful and mindful of his Salah. We learn about the conversation in the grave between the angels of uh, interrogation, the angels who are going to come, Munkir and Nakir, who are going to come and who are going to ask the person, who are going to make the person in the grave sit up and who are going to ask three questions that who was your Lord and who did you take as your prophet and which deen did you cling to? Then Hadith tells us that when the Munkir and Nakir will make the person sit up, he will be shown, the sun setting will be shown to him. That is, the time of the Asr Salah is passing off and the person, the bondsman who will be sitting in the grave, he will be shown that the sun is setting. And at the same time, the Munkir and Nakir will also be asking him the questions and he will see that the time of Asr Salah is passing. So he very confidently, not fearing the Munkir and Nakir, he will ask them to stay away and let me offer my Salah. And they will ask him that you need to answer your questions first. And he very confidently without any fear imagine in the grave all by himself solitary soul with those totally alien and stranger munkir and nakir and asking in their aggressive sounds and voices but he's staying confident and cool and composed and being worried about his salah this will be the honor this will be the honor of the person who was mindful of his salah throughout his life and then in the grave, the angels of punishment coming, the blind and the deaf angels of punishment coming with their maces to, to strike. What will prevent the angels of punishment when they will come from the right, from the right side of the bondsman who used to offer salah, the salah, all the deeds of salah will stand up and they will be a deterrent for these angels. And then they'll, they will come from the foot end 
and the footsteps of the person who used to walk to the congregational salah and used to walk to the to the mosque and remember the women folk who themselves themselves did not walk to the mosque for the congregational salah but they encouraged their sons they they motivated their brothers or they created the environment the meal timings and all and reminder for their husbands and motivated the men folk to go to the salah of congregational salah of the mosque inshallah then their footsteps towards the mosque they will stand up and they will be the deterrent for the angels of punishment of the grave and then when the angels will come from the left side the zakat will stop and when they will come from the front the charity the super arrogative charities beyond zakat will stop and then they will come from the head and and quran the quran which we are all reading and learning and reciting and trying to understand and trying to obey this quran will stand up and be a deterrent so this is salah and then after grave on the day of judgment what what will happen and how will salah help Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported by Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in Bustad Ahmad that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the person who performs salah there will be light and there will be salvation there will be there will be forgiveness for him on the day of resurrection but anyone who does not keep it there will be for him no light there will be for him no evidence of salvation and he will be with karun with firaun with haman and ubay bin khalf allahumma la tajalna minhum rabbi ja'alni maqim as-salati wa min zurriyyati and on the day of judgment the muazzin all the people who had been calling out the proclamation for for salah the muazzin will have what atwal an-nas a'naqu a'naqan yawm al-qiyamah the muazzin will have the longest necks on the day of judgment and the muazzin as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has promised that within the range of muazzin's voice whoever hears them the men the jinn anything they shall testify they shall testify on his behalf on the day of judgment similarly prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has promised hazrat abdullah bin abbas radhiyallahu ta'ala who has reported that freedom for fire of hell is written down for bondsman who calls the azan for 7 years for the sake of allah and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked on the day of judgment he said that i will come up to the river of qathar and i will intercede and i will recognize you the companions asked there were there going to be so many people and so many people how will you recognize us and he said muhajjilina min athar al wudu i will recognize you by the glowing and by the shining of the parts of the wudu and he advised whoever wants may increase your glow and this has been reported in bukhari and then we know by the words of a tradition reported in bukhari by hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam announced clearly that on the day of judgment when there there will be no shade other than the shade of allah other than the shade of the throne of allah and there there will be seven lucky people who will be admitted to the shade of the throne of allah out of these two two will be whom a youth who spent his youth in the worships of allah this is salah and the third will be the person whose heart ever clung to the mosque he was a person who was waiting for salah who was prayer who was who was waiting for salah who was planning his timetable according to the timetable of salah and then on the day of judgment how will salah be helpful hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala and who has reported in tirmizi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said on the day of judgment on the day of judgment salah will be the first action of the man to be accounted for so on the day of the judgment when the rights of allah will be inquired about the first question the first accountability about the rights of allah will be about salah and he added that if his prayer is found correct correct what that is in accordance with the method taught by the sunnah of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then the man will be declared successful otherwise unsuccessful and in case the obligatory actions of the man they will fall short allah almighty will say is there any supererogatory deeds in his account 
and if there will be any, they will serve up to make the deficiency in his obligatory worships in the same way all his actions will be accounted for. So Salah is what? It's going to be the first question on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. Malik Yom Middin has let out the main paper of the question of the day of judgment. Foolish will be he who does not make preparations for the answers of those questions. So the first question on the day of accountability, and then after the people will be handed over all their accounts, and they will be made to pass over the bridge of Sirat against Salah. Again, Salah will be helpful. Hazrat Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Tibrani that it was, it was told by Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that those who attend the mosque in the darkness of the night will visit Allah in, in the light on the day of resurrection. Similar are the words that those who attend the mosque in the darkness of the night, which, which salah, the salah of Fajr and the salah of Isha, Allah will bless them with very high and bright light on the day of resurrection. So Allah, Prophet ﷺ has also given the good news, a glad tiding of perfect light for all those who work to the mosque, who walk to the mosque in the darkness of night and offer prayers. The supplication which Quran has taught us, Rabbana atmim lana nurana waqfir lana innaka ala kulli shayin qadir is what is supplicating for nur and light on the bridge of Sarat. And this we will get by the supplication and by offering the congregational salah of Isha and Fajr. And then after passing over the bridge of Salah, uh, bridge of Sirat, Salah is what? Miftahul Jannah. It is the key to the door of Jannah. And remember, just realize, can you enter your own house? We can't even enter our own house if we don't have the key to the front door. So will we or will any be, anyone be able to enter his palace of Jannah if he does not have the Miftahul Jannah, the key to paradise, Salah with him? No, we will not. It is Salah. It is Salah. And once the person enters Salah, with his Salah will enter Jannah. Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Jannah, they will be adorned with ornaments of gold and silver. And Hadith explains till where? Till where the water of their wudu reach. So this is Salah. And remember, in Surah Mudassir, verse 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned when the people of hellfire will be asked, that what took them to hell, what took them to hell, they will say, Qalu, lam muswalleen, that they will answer that they were not among those who would establish Salah. They were not among those who established Salah. So it will be Salah throughout the journey of hereafter. Salah will be what will be supporting. That is why in Surah Tawha, as we've already gone through verse number 132, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered all of us, Wa'mur ahlaka bis salat fastabir alayha. Order your family members to offer salah and preserve it yourself and stay steadfast on it yourself. And that is why, exactly why, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam supplicated in Surah Ibrahim, verse 40, Rabbi jalni maqim as salati wa min suriyati. O oh Allah, O oh our sustainer, cause me and my offsprings to stay constant and stay steadfast in Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all establish Salah. Help, help our children and offsprings establish Salah. Accept from us all our Salah. Help us focus and concentrate in our Salah. Make our Salah. Make our salah a coolness of our eyes, a contentment of our hearts, and make us among those who start enjoying our salah. Rabbi ja'alli maqim as-salati wa min zurriyati, Rabbi ibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah. Verse number 12. 
And certainly, we created man from an extract of clay, and then we placed him as a sperm drop in a firm lodging, lodging where? In the womb of the mother. And then we made the sperm drop into a clinging clot, what? Alaka. And we made the clot into a lump, what? Muzga, lump of flesh. And we made from the lump bones, and we covered the bones with flesh, and we developed him into an another creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. So the first creation, as we've already repeated, uh, mentioned of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was how? With a sperm drop. And later on, the creation was with all these steps, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned here. And uh, the stages have been believed. And uh, the miraculous creation, how of all the embryological stages have been explained here. Then indeed, after that, you are to die. Then indeed, you on the day of resurrection will be resurrected. And we have created above you seven layered heavens. And never have we been of our creation unaware. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining all the signs around us. And we have sent down rain from the sky and in a myriad amount and settled it in the earth. And indeed, we are able to take it away. And we brought forth for you thereby gardens of palm trees and grapevines in which for you are abundant fruits and from which you eat. And we brought forth a tree issuing from the Mount Sinai, which produces oil and food for those who eat. And indeed, for you in livestock is a lesson. We give you drink from that which is in their bellies. And for you in them are numerous benefits and for them you eat and upon them and ships you are carried and we had certainly sent nu salam to his people and he said oh my people worship allah you have no deity other than him then will you not fear him but the imminent among those who disbelieved from his people said, this is not but a man like you yourselves who wishes to take precedence over you. And if Allah has will to send a messenger, he would have sent down angels. He, we have not heard of this among our forefathers. He is not but a man possessed with madness. So wait concerning him for a time. Nu alayhi salam said, my Lord, support me because they have denied me. So we inspired to him, construct the ship under our observation and our inspiration. And when our command comes and the oven flows, put into the ship from each creature, two maids and your family, except those for whom the decree of destruction has proceeded and do not address me concerning those who have wronged. Indeed, they are to be drowned. Who was that? Kenan, the son, son of Hazrat Nu, who was still disobedient. And when you have boarded the ship, you and those with you, then say, praise to Allah who has saved us from the wrongdoings and say, my Lord, let me land at a blessed land, play, landing place, and you are the blessed to best to accommodate us. This is the supplication which is taught by Quran for when we ride a boat or a sailing ship. Indeed, in that are signs, and indeed we are ever testing our servants. Then we produce after them a generation of others, and we sent them a messenger from themselves, saying, Worship Allah. Remember, all the messengers and all the prophets had the same basic primary message of Tawheed, the lesson of monotheism, the worshipping of one and only one, Allah. Worship Allah. You have no deity other than him. Then will you not fear him? And, and, and the imminent among his people who disbelieved and denied the meeting of your after while we had given them the luxury in the worldly life said, this is not but a man like yourselves. He eats from what uh, he eats from which you eat and drinks of what you drink. And if you should obey a man like yourselves, indeed, you would be losers. Does he promise you that when you have died and become dust and bones and you will be brought forth once more, how far, how far is that which you are promised? 
life is not but our worldly life. This is what those who were disbelieving the prophets announced. Life is not but our worldly life. We die and live and we will not be resurrected. He is not but a man who has invented a lie about Allah and we will not believe him. He said, my Lord, support me because they have denied me. Allah said, after a little, they will surely become regretful. So the shriek seized them in truth and we made them as a plant stubble, then away with the wrongdoing people. And then we produced after them other generations. No nation will precede its time of termination, nor will they remain thereafter. Then we sent our messengers in succession. Every time there came to a nation its messengers, they denied him. So we made them follow one another to destruction, and we made them narrations. So away with people who do not believe. Then we sent Musa salam, and his brother Harun salam, with our signs and clear authority to Pharaoh and his establishment. But they were arrogant and they were haughty people. They said, should we believe two men like ourselves while their people are for us in servitude? So they denied them and were of those who were destroyed. And we certainly gave Musa salam, the scripture that perhaps they would be guided. And we made the son of Maryam salam, and his mother a sign the son of Mary and his mother, a sign that is whom Hazrat Isa -Islam, and Hazrat Maryam -Islam, and sheltered them within a high ground, having level areas and flowing water. This was what? Bethul Laham, the place where Hazrat Isa -Islam was born. Uh, there were date trees and there was what? There was a spring of water also. Allah said, O messengers, eat from the good food and work righteousness. Indeed, I of what you do am all knowing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here what? Qulumin tayyibat means to eat what? What is clean, what is pure, what is hygienic, and what is permissible according to the laws of Allah. And do not indulge in eating to the extent that you tend to forget good and righteous deeds. Because you know what happens? Generally, overindulgence in food, not only food, the cooking, the activity, and plus obviously overeating. Overindulgence in food makes us forgetful and makes us get lazy. For example, like after a heavy meal, you must have generally heard people saying, oh my God, I even have to offer my salah. The full bellies, sometimes makes the person slow and lazy. And Prophet Sallallahu has taught us this application, what? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-qasli. But that is exactly what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying here also. And indeed this, your religion is one religion and I am your Lord, so fear me. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuka wal-afafa wal-ghina. But the people divided their religion among them into sects, so each faction in what it has is rejoicing. So leave them in their confusions for a time. So uh, do they think that what we extend to them of wealth and children is because we hasten for them good things? Rather, they do not perceive. Indeed, they who are apprehensive from fear of their Lord and they who believe in the signs of their Lord and they who do not associate anything with their Lord and they who give what they give while their hearts are fearful because they will be returning to their Lord. It is those who hasten to good deeds and they outstrip others therein. And we charge no soul except with what, except with that within its capacity. And with us is a record which speaks with truth and they will not be wronged. But their hearts are covered with confusion over this and they have evil deeds besides disbelief which they are doing until when we seize their effluent ones with punishment at once they are crying to Allah for help. Do not cry out today. Indeed, by us, you will not be helped. 
my verses, my verses had taken already been recited to you, but you were turning back on your heels in arrogance regarding it, conversing by night, speaking evil. Then have they not reflected over the Quran or has there come to them that which had not come to their forefathers or did they or did they not know their messengers so they are towards them this acknowledging or do they say in him is madness rather he brought them the truth uh, he brought them the truth but most of them to the truth are averse but if the truth had followed their inclination the heavens and the earth and whoever is in them would have been ruined rather we have brought them their message but they from their message are turning away or do you ask them for payment? But the reward of your Lord is best. He is the best of providers. And indeed, you invite them to a straight path. But indeed, those who do not believe in hereafter are deviating from the path. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Allahumma ihdina sirat al mustaqim. And even if we give them mercy and remove what was upon them of affliction, they would persist in their transgression, wandering blindly. And we had gripped them with suffering as a warning, but they did not yield to their Lord. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grips somebody in suffering, what do they need to do? To yield to their Lord, to submit to their Lord, to obey their Lord, and to for, seek forgiveness for their disobedience and arrogance, nor did they humbly supplicate or will continue thus until, until when we have opened before them a door of severe punishment, immediately they will, they will be therein in despair. And it is he who produced for you hearing and vision and hearts. Little are you grateful. And it is he who has multiplied you throughout the earth and to him you will be gathered. And it is he who gives you life and causes death and it is his and his is the alteration of the night and the day. And then you will not, will you not reason? Rather they say like that, what the former people said, they said, when we have died and become dust and bones, are we indeed to be resurrected? We have been promised this, we and our forefathers before. This is not but legends of the former people say to whom belongs the earth and whoever in it is in it. If you should know, they will say to Allah, say, then will you not remember? Say, who is the Lord of seven heavens and the Lord of the great throne? They will say they belong to Allah. Say, then will you not fear him? Say, in whose hand is the realm of all things? He protects while none can protect against him. If you should know, they will say, all belongs to Allah. Say, then how are you deluded? Rather, we have brought them the truth. Indeed, they are the liars. Allah has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. If there had been, then each deity would have taken what it created, and some of them would have sought to overcome the others. Exalted is Allah above what they describe concerning him. He is knower of the unseen and the witnessed. So high is he about what they associate with him. Say, my Lord, if you should show me that which they are promised, what the torments and the punishments, my Lord, then do not place me among the wrongdoing people. And indeed, we are able to show you what we have promised them repel by means of what is best their evil we are most knowing of what they describe and say my lord i seek refuge in you from the incitements of devil and i seek refuge in you my lord lest they be presented with me for such is the state of disbelievers until when Death comes to one of them. He says, my Lord, send me back that I might do righteousness in that which I left behind. No, it is only a word he is saying. And behind them is a barrier until the day they are resurrected. 
So when the horn is blown, no relationship will there be among them that day, nor will they be asked about one another. And those whose scales are heavy with good deeds, it is they who are successful. Allahumma ja'alla minhum. But those whose scales are light, with scales, the scales of good deed, those are the ones who have lost their souls, being in hell, abiding eternally. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. The fire will sear their faces. Allahumma ajirna min nar And they therein will have taught smiles. It will be said, were not my verses recited to you and you used to deny them? They will say, O oh Lord, our wretchedness overcame us and we were people astray. Our Lord, remove us from it. And if he were to return to evil, he would indeed be wrong to us. He will say, remain despised therein and do not speak to me. Indeed, there was a party of my servants who said, Our Lord, we have believed, so forgive us and have mercy upon us, and you are the best of merciful. But Allah will say to the inmates, You took them in mockery to the point that they made you forget my remembrance, and you used to laugh at them. Indeed, I have rewarded them whom whom the non-believers used to mock, I have rewarded them this day for their patient endurance that they are the attainers of success. Allah will say, how long did you remain on the earth in the number of years? They will say, we remained a day or a part of a day. Ask those who enumerate. He will say, you stayed not, but a little, if only you had known. Then did you think? that we created you uselessly and that to us you would not be returned. So exalted is Allah, the sovereign, the truth. There is no deity except him, Lord of the noble throne. And whoever invokes besides Allah another deity for which he has no proof, then his account is only with his Lord. Indeed, the disbelievers will not succeed. And O oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, my Lord, forgive and have mercy and you are the best of merciful. This is the supplication taught by Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it is also taught by Quran. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimeen. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to advise to recite this supplication before death, to ask for forgiveness and mercy before death. Because these are both very, very important for the eternal abode. Prophet used to very frequently supplicate for the mercy of Allah and for the blessings of Allah. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her, she asked him one day the reason why he used to ask for the mercy of Allah. And he told her, Aisha, no one will enter Jannah until the mercy of Allah befalls him. And she asked him innocently, like a young child would. She asked him, not even you, my dear Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, yes, not even me, until the mercy of Allah encompasses me also. So we need to say very frequently, Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite these verses frequently during the month of Ramadan also. Rabbi <laughs> 